Good evening. My name is Michelle Bird Fielder, and I'm the first VP and Chair of Membership Services for Central Jersey Alumni Chapter. On behalf of our president, Karen Wade Culp, and the 285 soars of CJA, I want to warmly welcome you to tonight's important town hall. Delta Sigma Theta is a sisterhood of college educated women founded in 1913 at Howard University who are committed to, the public, to public service with a primary emphasis on the black community. Our 1,061 chapters establish programs in local communities, both in the US and around the world. We just chartered two new chapters in Southern and West Africa this month. Our programs are centered around our five point programmatic thrust areas, which include economic development, educational development, international awareness and involvement, physical and mental health, political awareness and involvement, as well as our arts and letters and social action commissions. The Central Jersey alumni chapter was chartered on November 8, 1975 and serves Middlesex, Somerset and Union counties. Tonight's program is brought to you by our dynamic social action committee. And we'll be focusing on health disparities as it relates to the COVID 19 pandemic. And we also want to provide you with a better understanding of the COVID-19 vaccines that are available. Our communities have suffered greatly over the past 14 months, economically, physically, and emotionally. Let's go forth with this intention from Paolo Coelho as we spend this time together this evening. When we least expect it, Life sets us a challenge to test our courage and willingness to change. At such a moment, there's no point in pretending that nothing has happened or saying that we're not yet ready. The challenge will not wait. Life does not look back. And so it is with COVID-19. This virus will not wait. It keeps going on and mutating and spreading and the only way out is for us to educate ourselves about this vaccine and help each other get the information we need to make an informed choice. And that's what we're here to do tonight with our panels of distinguished doctors and experts in the field. And I think it's time for our first poll. Have you been vaccinated? Following the poll, Dr. Avanya Richardson Miller, the director of Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Hackensack Meridian Health Corporation will moderate our first panel. Again, welcome to the program. Ending the poll in about 10 seconds here. Okay. Okay, I think we're we're good enough. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, um, thank you, thank you for this opportunity to be with you tonight, and um, I'm excited to see that 87 percent of our participants tonight have indicated that they have already been vaccinated. That is well over the 70% target that we have to reach herd immunity. So if we were just dealing with this group tonight, we would be at herd immunity. For the 13% that um, have not yet uh, been vaccinated, I wanna say thank you for logging in for tonight's um, educational webinar. And we're glad that you're seeking this education. I can say that as a person who started off 2021 with a huge level of vaccine hesitancy myself, that about a month and a half ago, I actually became fully vaccinated. And um, what really was uh, triggered that change was attending uh, informational webinars like this here tonight. So we hope that the information that we share um, can um, enlighten you so that you can make a, an informed de decision about your hesitancy for the vaccine as well. I'm going to lead right into tonight's um, panel discussion and I will be introducing the doctors on our panelists tonight and with right after my brief introduction, I will present them with an opening question. So uh, our first uh, doctor is Dr. 
Dio Hewlett. Um, he is the medical director for the Division of Disease Control, deputy to the commissioner at Westchester County Department of Health in uh, White Plains, New York. Also an adjunct associate professor of microbiology and immunology at the New York Medical College and an infectious disease consultant at Calvary Hospital in New York. He's also a member of the National Medical Association COVID Vaccine Task Force. So Dr. Hewlett, uh, welcome and thank you so much for uh, serving as a panelist on tonight's uh, uh, panel discussion. My opening question for you is, um, please explain the vaccines that are currently available, uh, how they are different and why that's important. And also please speak to the recent pause uh, of administering the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Richardson and uh, good evening to all of you and thank you so much for having me participate. Yes. Currently, there are actually three different vaccines that are available uh, for the prevention of COVID. Uh, two of the vaccines, the vaccine by the Pfizer BioNTech company uh, and the vaccine by the Moderna company, they are both what we call messenger RNA vaccines. That is the platform by which they uh, are operating. And uh, the third vaccine, which is currently on pause, is the Johnson & Johnson, also known as the Janssen vaccine. And that vaccine has what we call a viral vector platform. All three of these vaccines were subjected to very rigorous clinical trials. And in those clinical trials, they actually involved over uh, 30 to 40,000 individuals. And the effectiveness and the safety and the tolerability of the vaccines were actually compared in a very objective and scientific way. Uh, and in all three of the cases, the vaccines were shown to be highly effective. The Pfizer and the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna vaccine were between 94 and 95% effective. And the John Johnson and Johnson or Janssen vaccine was uh, found to be about 85% effective overall. All three of the vaccines were very effective in preventing serious or severe disease, hospitalization, and death. The major difference between the uh, Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna vaccines versus the Johnson & Johnson is that the Pfizer and the um, Moderna require two doses. Uh, the Pfizer product, uh, the doses are 21 days apart. The Moderna uh, product, they're 28 days apart. The Janssen, or also known as Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is a single dose uh, vaccine. As far as the pause that was taken just last week for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, I think it's important for everyone to know that this was done at the advice of our Food and Drug Administration and also our Centers for Disease Control. They were watching very closely, looking for what we call safety signals. And it's a good thing that this is what they do. They monitor for safety signals. There were, I believe, six or seven cases of uh, clotting disorders uh, that were noted in people who had received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. All of the individuals who were, in, who were noted to have this serious adverse event, as we call it, were women between the ages of 18 and 48 years of age. There was, as I understand it, a fatal event. And because vaccines are given to people who are otherwise healthy, we act in an abundance of caution. So whenever this is seen, we actually have to really take pause and analyze what has happened. Keep in mind that these events were occurring in seven people out of about 7 million doses of the vaccine that had been administered. So we're talking about events that occurred in one out of every 1 million doses. So this was infrequent, but because the, the events were so serious, the FDA and CDC recommended this pause and the European Medicines Agency in Europe took similar action. And as of yesterday, they actually lifted their pause and they felt that they could do so 
as long as the company agreed to place enhanced labeling explaining the precaution uh, on their label so that it would be understood uh, that uh, these things did happen. And according to uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, he is anticipating that probably by the end of this week, we will have uh, a report from our FDA here in the United States. And it is likely that they will make some sort of a pronouncement in terms of, uh, of the pause, in terms of lifting the pause. We are all hopeful that the pause will be lifted, but we don't take these things lightly. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hewitt, for that um, response. It, very valuable information included there. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Rose St. Floor, uh, who is a pediatrician. She's the clinical professor and medical director of the Center for Breastfeeding at Hackensack Meridian Health's uh, Jersey Shore University Medical Center. So welcome, Dr. St. Floor, and thank you for uh, being a part of our panel discussion this evening. Uh, my thank you very much. My question for you is, how is vaccine hesitancy being addressed in the Black community? And why is vaccine access a problem? So um, I think it's better to sort of answer the second part and then roll into the first part. So in our Black and Brown communities, vaccine access is very challenging for a number of reasons. One, you cannot just access this vaccine the way you could access any other vaccine because the first two vaccines that we had received that were appropriate uh, for our population, the ones that were approved for emergency use, were the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. The storage that was required for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines uh, called for larger institutions uh, to be uh, ready and available to store these vaccines. So therefore you cannot just get the vaccine at a doctor's office. You can't just get it at a clinic, for example. Oftentimes you would need to go to a larger center, uh, which often, which were the places that had the uh, ability to store these vaccines in very cold temperatures. So as a result of that, a system for registering for these vaccines was in place, which then called for you to have to go online. Well, one, have internet access. That was consistent. Wi-Fi access. Uh, then you would have to go online and you would have to enter your insurance information and a whole bunch of other information just to register for the vaccine. And so for more marginalized populations, poorer populations, accessing web access, uh, internet access in order to even register the vaccine for the vaccine was a challenge. Um, New Jersey attempted to try to rectify that by putting in a hotline, which New York had had from the very beginning. But unfortunately, the hotline was not enough and uh, the hotline was getting congested and people were getting very frustrated and were still unable to reach a live person so that they could sign up for the vaccine over the phone. And with time, you know, the more times you try and the more times you put in that effort and finding yourself unsuccessful, you're sort of sliding back into a place where you begin to wonder whether or not the vaccine is even needed. You know, is it even really appropriate? And then that takes us to the vaccine hesitancy realm. And of course, um, in black and brown communities, there's a, a very understandable sense of hesitancy for all types of medical interventions, not just the vaccine, but really going across the board, of course, you know, related to our history, uh, the way that black and brown people were treated in our hospital systems, and then now traveling to this relatively new thing that we're doing, you know, that sense of mistrust is definitely there. And if you have on the one side, inability to easily and quickly access the vaccine interfacing with this community doubt that's there, then what ends up happening is you, you have communities that are really just electing to just hold off or not get vaccinated at all. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that response. Um, next, I'll move on to uh, Dr. Noel Aikman. And uh, Dr. Aikman, uh, thank you. Uh, for joining us tonight and welcome to tonight's panel. Uh, Dr. Aikman is an OBGYN. She's a director of obstetrics at Hackensack Meridian Health's Jersey Shore University Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Aikman, um, my opening question for you is, 
Um, can you please explain why people of color have a higher rate of mortality with COVID-19 than uh, white Americans? It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, so black women have four times higher mortality rate than white men. And, and our black men are far, far higher rate than any other sex and racial group. So I'm gonna start out with the politically correct response. So we tend to have comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, which are associated with increased risk. Mm -hmm. But if you correct for these underlying chronic conditions, we're still more likely to die from COVID. So then you have to look at the social determinants of health. So people of color tend to be essential workers. We're the people who work in the grocery stores, in the factories, we do custodial work, we're bus drivers. And with a lot of these places, they had weak enforcement of masking. And this increased our exposure to individuals who were infected with COVID. We also tend to live in multi-generational homes. And some of us do not have the means to appropriately quarantine. And then you come down to some of the systemic issues. So there've been shortage of testing in communities of color, and this persists to this day. So despite symptoms, we're not getting tested. And remember, hospitals were, and some are still only testing patients when they're admitted. And especially in the early days of COVID, COVID most of these symptomatic patients were sent home. They were told to come back if the symptoms got worse and our symptoms tend to be overlooked anyway. Another thing is that a lot of the times we're not listened to. Um, we've heard about the black physician in New York whose symptoms were not taken seriously, even though she told them she was a physician and that she was sure she had COVID who eventually died. So a lot of the issues are really systemic. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Aikman um, for, for that response. I am going to or circle back to Dr. Hewlett and um, with a, another question. Uh, so Dr. Hewlett, what are clinical trials and please explain why representation matters. Sure. Um, let me start with um, going back a little bit in history. Um, <clears throat> back in 1906, we actually had the passage of the Food and Drug, the Pure F Food and Drug Act here in the United States. Prior to that time, uh, medicines and other types of medical products could be sold without any data, any objective scientific data backing up the claims of the salespeople who were actually selling it. And you might have heard the term snake oil salesman. And these were people who were selling things that were claimed to uh, provide cures for just about anything without actually having data to prove the effectiveness and the safety of these products. And so the Pure Food and Drug Act actually prohibited that type of activity. And it laid the foundation for our current uh, FDA, uh, which actually now has a structure uh, which requires uh, the manufacturers of drugs and vaccines to actually have objective scientific data backing up the claims that the product or the vaccine actually works and that it's actually safe. So clinical trials are actually sets of procedures we call protocols, which are essentially put into place which will allow the person, the individual uh, pro um, manufacturer, or it may be uh, the National Institutes of Health or other organizations to compare uh, the effectiveness and the safety of a product against, in most cases, what we call placebo, uh, or in some cases, it will be against an existing product. 
these uh, protocols are most effective and most trusted if they are what we call controlled, blinded, and randomized. And after these trials are run, we have objective data. There are predetermined endpoints, as we call them. And if the endpoints are met, we then can feel very certain that the product, in this case, the vaccine, is actually effective in doing what we thought it would do. It's very, very important to have representation. And with these vaccine trials, uh, it's, it was important to have representation of people of different ethnic groups, people of different uh, racial groups, people from different parts of the world, as well as people of different ages. And I think that although there could very well have been more diversity in these trials. I think that the manufacturers actually did attempt to have a, a, a good cross section of representation. Uh, and this is very important because when the trials are done and when the product, in this case, the vaccines are available, we would like to be able to say that they work just as well in all racial groups and all ethnic groups and that they're efficacy or, or the safety is essentially the same across all of those groups. And so clinical trials are very important because they provide us with the objective data uh, by which we can uh, all feel that the effectiveness, the tolerability, and the safety of the products has been scientifically determined. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for that response. And so just want to time check here. We have about five minutes left on this uh, portion of tonight's event. And I want to get into questions, one for, for, one for Dr. Aikman and one for Dr. St. Floor. So um, I'll, I'll lead in with uh, Dr. St. Floor first, because it's a great uh, follow-up question from, um, from uh, Dr. Hewlett. And so uh, can you please um, share the latest data from clinical trials regarding uh, the COVID vaccine um, as it relates to children. And yes. we, if you could do it in about two and a half minutes or less. Oh, yes, certainly. Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so the clinical trials for children uh, began uh, late last year. So around October of last year, Moderna did begin clinical trials studying the vaccine, uh, the, its mRNA vaccine in children uh, 12 to 17 years of age. Pfizer uh, was very close behind uh, uh, studying about uh, 2,000 children. Um, Pfizer just completed their trial. Um, and on March 31st, they announced that they uh, found the vaccine to be 100% effective, so even better. Um, in children uh, compared to adults. Um, so now Pfizer and Moderna are both looking at the efficacy of the vaccine for children uh, six, to 11, six months to 11 years of age. Um, they are both enrolling patients. Uh, Pfizer is enrolling about 5,000 patients and Moderna is enrolling about 6,000 patients. And that's currently ongoing. Um, the AstraZeneca and Moderna vaccine, uh, sorry, and the Johnson and Johnson vaccines um, are not too far behind. Johnson and Johnson right now has no trials for children, but AstraZeneca did begin their trials uh, in February. Um, but unfortunately, they did put a pause on their trial, uh, not because of any adverse outcomes they found in children, but because of the concern that was raised about the Johnson and Johnson vaccines and the risk for thrombus. So until we get further information, uh, they've put a uh, temporary pause uh, on studying uh, their vaccine in children. So right now that's on hold. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that yeah. information. And uh, so uh, Dr. Aikman, um, you get the final question in this segment and it is really a hot topic. So um, looking forward to you responding to this. And so my question for you is please address the concerns um, regarding this vaccine as it relates to infertility and uh, pregnancy? Okay, so let's take pregnancy first. Um, so COVID has infections are more severe in pregnant women um, compared to non-pregnant um, con counterparts. It increases the risk of hospital admissions, ICU stays, and death. And these patients have a higher rate of preterm delivery. 
If the patients survive, they may not see their babies for months. And so I think people need to understand that. What people also need to do is that, know is that although women, pregnant women weren't included in the original studies, we, there were women who got pregnant. Um, and so it doesn't really affect our, your, fertil your fertility. There's never been any vaccine that has really affected people's uh, fertility. In and of the women who got pregnant, they went on, in each group, there were equal numbers. Two of the people in the non-vaccine group had miscarriages. The people in the vaccine group went on to normal pregnancies. Pfizer has started um, vaccine trials on pregnant women. They started it in February. 2021. Um, and the vaccine also is not a live vaccine. We do give vaccines in pregnancy for people who are really concerned about the effect on their babies. I mean, that's totally natural. We suggest getting the vaccine in the second trimester when the baby is already developed and there shouldn't be any issues with um, development. Thank you so much for that response. And we nailed it, it's 7.30. So <laughs> this brings our panel to uh, our session to a close. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank our panel of experts, Drs. Rose St. Fleur, Noel Aikman, and Dial Hewlett for a very informative presentation. We can't say we weren't informed. I certainly learned uh, several new things listening to their presentation. And thank you again to our esteemed for Dr. Avanya Richardson Miller, who did a fantastic job moderating the panel. So we're now gonna move to our second panel, a call to action addressing the health disparities. And it's my great pleasure to introduce two more titans of industry. Our featured panelist, Dr. Jane Middlebrooks Morgan, who I have known for many years we were both Spelmanites and Pledge Delta through Eta Kappa. And our own CJ's own, Dr. Patricia Whitley Williams, who is the Director of Pediatrics at Robert Wood Johnson Hospital. She's a specialist in immunology and infectious diseases. Without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Pat Whitley Williams. Thank you so much, Michelle. Good evening, everyone. And I welcome Dr. Jane Morgan. Um, I'm going to be very brief in her introduction, which um, I, she is just a phenomenal uh, cardiologist. She is presently the clinical director of the COVID task force at the Piedmont Healthcare Corporation in Atlanta, Georgia. And within this role, she's developing ongoing community outreach in conjunction uh, with the Division of Diversity uh, and Inclusion between Piedmont Healthcare and the African American community it serves. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Morgan. Good evening. Um, I think there are some questions in the uh, chat, but I'd first like to just get your um, uh, get you to discuss a little bit about health disparities in the Black and Brown community. You are a cardiologist, uh, and so you well know um, these disparities. And, and, and talk about the impact of COVID-19. Why have we been so disproportionately affected? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, introduction, Dr. Whitley Williams. And I appreciate being here tonight. 
You know, certainly when we look at uh, the American Heart Association and um, our campaigns, one of the things that we note with women and Black women um, in particular is, you know, our risk factors for heart disease are greater for premature heart disease than other groups. So we have a higher rate of obesity, a higher rate of hypertension, higher rate of elevated cholesterol. Not only do these things put us at risk, they create these comorbidities, these chronic medical conditions that we hear about in the COVID vaccine trials and also with um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19. What we know is that people who have chronic medical conditions are at greater risk if you're infected with COVID-19 of moving on to more complications and hospitalizations than people who do not have chronic medical conditions. So for instance, if you have significant cardiac disease, heart disease, and you contract COVID-19, you're six times more likely to be admitted to the hospital. And once you're admitted to the hospital, you're 12 times as likely to die than another person with COVID who does not have heart disease. Chronic medical conditions are um, incredibly important to the survival and the morbidity of this disease. When we look at the trials of both Moderna and Pfizer, but as well as Johnson & Johnson, we see that although chronic medical conditions were not specifically trialed, they also were not excluded. And so for instance, if we look at cardiac disease, over 3000 people were included, diabetes as well, 3,300 people, hypertension, 8,800 people, cancer of any type, 1,473 people, HIV, 176 people, chronic lung disease, three, chronic liver disease, 376 people. And so we want to understand that even though medical conditions were not specifically studied in this trial, that was not the purpose of these trials, the purpose was to understand the safety and efficacy of these vaccines in protecting us from disease and preserving life, these medical conditions were not excluded either. And so we want people with chronic medical conditions, these so-called comorbidities, comorbidities to be certain to step up and take this vaccine to protect yourself. And if you are unclear on whether you have a chronic medical condition, if you have a prescription medication that you take on a regular basis, then that's you. And we have to all consider that and move forward with it. The other thing that I'll say before I stop is that we are 13 months into this pandemic and the years of life lost for the black community is almost three years. Our life expectancy in the last 13 months has decreased by almost three years. And so when we talk about social determinants of health, pharmacy deserts, access, we issue clinical trials, which is, which is one of my passions. We don't want to participate in clinical trials because of all of the historical context, certainly understandable, but we also have to understand that clinical trials provide access to healthcare. They provide access to therapies. This is the hidden gem. If you look at Donald Trump, when he contracted COVID-19 and was flown to Walter Reed, the first thing he received was Regeneron's monoclonal antibody therapy. Most people had never heard of it. The reason is you can only get it if you're enrolled in that clinical trial. He received it under emergency use authorization as the president of the United States and the only other people to receive it are those who are in clinical trials. It was clearly credited with interrupting his downward trajectory of a 74 year old male, overweight, sitting in the White House, desaturating. So we have to understand that maximal medical care is what we need to demand and not optimal medical care. Optimal medical care is you're treated to the top of FDA approved drugs and devices. We need maximal care where we have access to tomorrow's medications today. If you are uninsured or underinsured, 
this is also how you or your patient can get access to medical care. Mm -hmm. Because the drug companies by and large will cover your medical care because they need your data such that they can get their things, their medications approved. Not only that, you have access to a physician, a principal investigator who's overseen your trial. That principal investigator is overseen by a regional doctor. The regional doctor is overseen by a national doctor. You have direct access to a research nurse or research coordinator, direct contact 24 hours a day. If you sneeze, if you lose an eyelash, if your tooth hurts, whatever you want to talk about and report. I am a cardiologist. I don't even have access like that. Where else do you get access like that? When we talk about narrowing the gap in health equity in this country, we must begin to talk about our participation in clinical trials to really narrow that gap. And the last thing that I will say is oncology trials, cancer trials. We have cancers that are more prevalent in our group than in other groups, certain types of breast cancer, um, liver cancer, prostate cancer, um, colon cancer. Oncology trials specifically have been shown to increase the rate of remission yes. of your disease. Yes. And yet we have white men who enroll in these trials mm -hmm. and then their data is submitted to the FDA. Mm -hmm. And then those cancer agents are approved based on their data, but we're yeah. the ones with the disease. Right, yes, so true. These are all things that we have to think about because I know we are concerned about being guinea pigs and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. But in 2021, on which end of the research spectrum are we really the guinea pigs? Are we on the guinea, are we the guinea pigs at the beginning and we don't participate? Mm -hmm. Or are we guinea pigs at the end where we have allowed an entire drug development process to move forward with no information on us? So we have to be able to Again, to think about this and rearrange our thinking, move from exploitation to representation and begin to narrow that gap of health equity and think about that with regard to clinical trials and with regard to this COVID pandemic that has decreased our length of years by almost three years. Thank you, Dr. Morgan, for all of those excellent points. You have really driven at home. I want to ask you one more question before we take some questions from the chat, um, because I understand there are some in there. So we have three vaccines. One is on pause, uh, mm -hmm. all effective um, in terms of preventing serious disease, hospital hospitalization, even death. So for those people who are hesitant or lack the confidence to get a vaccine, a COVID-19 vaccine. Could you address that? Yeah, just raise some of the, how do you talk to someone or what points would you raise uh, yeah. someone who's hesitant to be vaccinated? Absolutely. And, and again, you know, it's the trust factor and are we participating? So do we have confidence in this data? So if you look at Moderna, Moderna enrolled 30,000 people in its phase three trial. 10.3% of those were African-Americans. Pfizer enrolled 40,000, 9.8% were African-Americans. And Johnson & Johnson enrolled about 42,000, 13% are African-Americans. Mm -hmm. And if you include Africans, it's a total of 19%. I wrote an article about Moderna last summer, fairly mm -hmm. critical of their phase one and phase two programs that had only included black people. And they had identified their dose that they were moving into phase three without our representation. I analyzed that data in those trials and that was published. And to my surprise, two weeks later, Moderna called me and we had a conversation. What I will say to their credit, they agreed we do need to do better. So when I tell you that these companies were intentional and purposeful in recruiting 
African Americans into these trials. We don't participate in trials. Right. They achieved over 110,000 patients, almost 10 or 11 percent were African Americans. So I think we should feel confident mm -hmm. that the data that went before the FDA was relevant to our population. The other thing that I will say is when you look at the, the data of Moderna and Pfizer, mm -hmm. and you look specifically at the African American population, that demographic within those trials, when you look at the briefing documents that went to the FDA mm -hmm. that were used to give us our emergency use authorization, mm -hmm. the Black population, every single person had zero incidences of symptomatic COVID disease two weeks following the second dose for Moderna and one week following the second dose of Pfizer. What I'm saying to you is even though these vaccines were 94.5% effective and 95% effective, their efficacy rates for the black population, it was 100% efficacy. We had zero incidences of COVID. So you should think about that. Think about what participation in clinical trials mean. It means that someone like me can give you information on yourself. Mm -hmm. So think about those kinds of things when we think about whether we should step up and take these vaccines or not. Um, I know everybody has very specific questions, but these are just general mm -hmm. answers. Thank you so much uh, for those answers. That was fantastic. I think some of the questions that are in the um, in the chat box, one of those has to do with, um, uh, there's a question, I'm fully vaccinated with both doses. Do you build up antibodies for the COVID virus uh, after this? Um, and, and maybe also would you answer if you have had COVID, the actual infection, should you get vaccinated? Mm -hmm. So I'll start with the second question. The answer to that is yes, if you've had COVID, you should still get vaccinated for some of the reasons that I've already um, talked about, but I wasn't specific enough. So when we talk about chronic medical conditions, when I talked about all those chronic medical conditions that were included, people who were COVID positive were also included in those tracks. Okay. So we want to we want to tell you that people who've had COVID were also in the trials, and we also their data is a part of that. So we are recommending. That's one of the reasons we're recommending. But the other reason that we're recommending that people who've had COVID get the vaccine is because your immunity after ninety days is unclear. So we are unclear. Some might have longer lasting immunity, some may not. We are unclear who's who and how to separate that. Mm -hmm. So we want to make certain that everybody has standard levels of immunity that are not waning that we can scientifically follow. And so we recommend that every person even, the, even if you've been infected with COVID, once your symptoms have resolved, you move forward with also receiving the vaccinations. And at this point, we are still saying if it's Moderna and Pfizer, you would receive both doses. At this point, that could change. I'll date this. This is April 21st, 2021. Uh, okay. That's what we're saying today. And you know, this landscape constantly changes. So, Okay. Thank you so much for that response. We have all our panelists back. Um, uh, I am, should I turn it over to you, Niambi? No, you want me to keep asking questions, okay. Um, for any of our panelists, do you think uh, it will be likely that we will require boosters next year? So I think it's absolutely uh, essential that we consider how our behaviors are driving that likelihood. Mm -hmm. um, as a society, we have not been able to all move forward with public health measures, with reliably masking, washing our hands, um, practicing social distancing. We are the host of this virus. We are part of that life cycle of the virus. And so for Moderna and Pfizer specifically, since we are now 13 months into this pandemic, they are very much working on a third formulation because multiple mutations have developed since their trials closed. They are aware of that. 
Johnson & Johnson trialed under more challenging environment than Moderna and Pfizer. Mm -hmm. uh, trialed against a lot of the current circulating mutations. And so even though that efficacy was less, they also um, were um, 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 enrolling patients who were exposed to all of these current mutations that did not exist with Moderna and Pfizer. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to compare apples and oranges. However, if we cannot reach herd immunity within a certain amount of time, Johnson & Johnson will be in the same position as Moderna and mm -hmm. Pfizer and having to reformulate a second dose to come back to cover mutations that did not exist. So it is our responsibility. People often ask me, when can I stop wearing this mask and regain my freedom? And my answer is, you can stop wearing the mask as soon as we all start wearing the mask. That's the Good quickest answer. way, stop wearing this mask. Good answer, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Uh, Aikman, I had a question. Um, if you are pregnant um, and you do get vaccinated, are they following the pregnant women to see if there is any harm, uh, you know, either during the rest of the pregnancy or to the newborn or around the time of delivery? Yes. Yeah, so uh, Pfizer started a study on pregnant women in February of 2021, and we just had a recent publication of um, the vaccine to pregnant women and the fact that it does uh, transfer immunity to the neonates um, through the placenta and also through breastfeeding. So these studies are ongoing. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions, Niambi, in the chat? I don't... Um... And I'll add to what Dr. Aiken has said. Yes. I just want to remind everyone that there's a VSAFE app and so please register with it. If you are pregnant, we absolutely want you to register. We have 87,000 pregnant women who register with that Be Safe app. We have a lot of information. The first 30,000 of those women who were pregnant at the time of vaccination or became pregnant afterwards, all of their information has already been reviewed by the CDC and their Committee on Immunizations panel. So we want you Use the Be Safe app so we can continue to gather information and learn about that. Those 30,000 women so far, it appears that they had less um, percentage, a lower percentage of miscarriage or spontaneous abortions, intrauterine growth retardation, gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia. When they looked at those 30,000 women who registered in the Be Safe app, so this is not scientific, it is the pregnant women who registered. So we don't know how many didn't register. Those 30,000 women had a lower incidence of all of those complications of pregnancy than the general population. And so the Society of Fetal Maternal Medicine and uh, I've forgotten the name of the society. ACOG. 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 And then one specifically with reproduction, I've forgotten, Society of reproduction. But two, that specifically, I know the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine specifically came out and said, not only do they want, if they looked at that data, do they want pregnant women to be immunized, they also want women desiring, that's the term that they use, desiring to be pregnant, to also be immunized. So the VSAFE app, please register all of your data. Anything that you think is significant, put it in there. We're looking at it. Thank you so much again. I know we're at 7.52, there was time. I think I'm gonna turn this over to Gwen. Thank you, Dr. Pitt. Yeah, okay. There are Thank several you. questions in the Q&A. One is, um, can someone speak to what it means to get vaccinated? I find that the younger population think, oh, I'm vaccinated, so I'm fine, and become careless in terms of activities and continuing to safeguard themselves. What, how do you stop that mindset? I'm sorry, and the question is that they feel that once they're vaccinated, they can go out. They're free to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'll take a stab at it since it is about younger people. And so that kind of falls into pediatric territory. Um, and so it, it should, uh, everyone should know that right now, even with the pediatric trials that I was talking about, 
um, children can get vaccinated. If you are 16 years old and above, you are eligible to receive the Pfizer vaccine and you can get it today. You can register and you can get uh, that vaccine <clears throat> because we do know that it is effective <clears throat> in our young people 16 years and up. It is very difficult for younger people to really understand what it means to continue to appropriately social distance and avoid large crowds and avoid masking. And so at the same time, while we are giving our teenagers and our young people the vaccine, we should also be educating them on the concept of herd immunity. And the way I like to describe herd immunity is I like to say that the fewer people in the community that have the virus, that have the disease, the better your vaccine is going to work for you. So the less likely you are to get the disease in general, because there's fewer people in the population who have it, then the more effective your vaccine is gonna be, the closer to that 95% efficacy that we're talking about, you're going to get. The opposite is also true. If there is a lot of virus circulating in your community, even even if you are vaccinated, you are increasing your chances of getting the disease anyway, because the vaccine is still not yet 100% effective uh, in general. And so, you know, when you look at communities overall as a whole, if you are vaccinated yourself, but you're embedding yourself in a community where there is a lot of viral load, then you are reducing your own uh, uh, your own resilience and resistance against the disease, which means then you can bring it home to your family, to your friends, your mom, your grandma, you know, people that you love that may get much sicker from this disease than you would yourself if you had it yourself. Thank you. Dr. Ackman, I'd like to direct this next question to you. If someone has been notified they are a close contact of a person who has been tested positive, when should they take a COVID test? Usually we are having people get tested about five days after they've been in contact. Um, that's usually when you become infected. Thank you. I had another question. What percentage of the homeless has been vaccinated in New Jersey, if any of you might know? Not sure. Yeah, I don't think we have that information at HMH. I have not heard any uh -huh. report on that for the homeless population in particular. Thank you. How do you get included in a trial? Um, so I'll let me myself in and um, answer that question. And so we are uh, working to uh, increasingly reduce barriers because right now trials are generally located at large medical centers and sometimes we don't have access and we also don't have relationships and our physicians don't necessarily have relationships with these medical centers. And so um, part of what I uh, posited in the article that I wrote about Moderna when I challenged them was I challenged them to um, not only identify black physicians, but put in the work to train them to become principal investigators. 80% of black patients are seen by black physicians. If you really want to increase diversity in your trials, then we need to train our black physicians to be researchers because what we know is the most common reason someone will agree to enroll in a trial is if they are approached by a trusted physician. And so that is part of what we are working to do. The other thing is you need to have people who look like us in leadership positions in research, such as there's a voice there, there's influence there, and there's cultural congruency as you oversee um, different programs. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. Certainly there's a lot of distrust um, in the healthcare system, in research, in an uneasy relationship with the US government. Um, and so none of these things can be done lightly, and yet we do still need to begin to kind of peel this back and move it forward. If you're looking for trials, you can go on websites at your local universities um, and see what you see there, or um, you can go to um, just the clinicaltrials.gov. Um, I hesitate to recommend clinicaltrials.gov because it can be very science-y and then hard to navigate. However, the information is there at this point. 
um, and we hopefully are moving towards uh, getting something that's a little bit more user friendly. Oh, I would just like to add to that, that at Hackensack Meridian Health, that we have begun doing some intentional outreach to um, our communities of color specifically. Um, and we were partnering also with the faith-based community and are open to partner with other organizations as well to be very intentional around trying to increase diverse representation in our clinical trials. Thank you. When does the vaccine go from being approved for emergency use only to being fully approved for lack of having a better term? Um, so one of the things that we're, we're that, that is, so for approval for trial, you need three things. Uh, we need all safety, we need the efficacy, and we need immunity data. We have safety and efficacy data. What we didn't have was all of the immunity data. We had 60 days of data that was presented to the FDA on immunity to grant the emergency use authorization. That was the minimum requirement to meet the emergency use authorization. It was granted under emergency use authorization because it was felt that the health of the American public was in jeopardy and that there were no other viable alternative medications or interventions available to the population. Generally, with an FDA approval, all of these thousands of patients that we've talked about, you would follow them out for a long period of time, maybe up to a year. So we would have all that immunity data. But in this case, we did not. We followed them for two months and then it came out under an emergency use authorization. Recently, just last week, both Pfizer and Moderna completed and submitted their six month immunity data. So we know that we have six months of immunity with both of these vaccines. Next month, we'll have seven months of data. The month after that, we'll have eight months of data. <laughs> month after that, we'll have nine months of data. We literally are in this all in real time. That's emergency use authorization. It doesn't compromise safety. It doesn't compromise efficacy, but we don't have all of the immunity data. So I suspect that when enough of the immunity data is available, generally it's one year, but it might be nine months for this particular situation, then the FDA will move forward with approval. They also will review any types of cases, people who are reporting things in theirs and VSAFE, that type of thing, but the immunity data is what we're waiting on. So when people ask, is this going to be a vaccine every year or every 10 years? We don't know. We're, we are, We'll stay tuned. Thank you. I'm gonna ask one last question. Um, I've seen several reports of black men having ED after having COVID-19. Is this temporary? And is this only happening to some black men? I haven't seen those reports and in talking to my urological uh, cohorts, uh, they have not had any issues with infertility, but I really don't have that much information on that data. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn this back over to Dr. Matt. Dr. Patricia Whitley Williams. Uh, yes, um, I think at this point, first of all, I'd like to thank all our panelists. And I believe I wanna bring Naomi back in as well. Are you on Naomi? All right, yes, thank you so much. So um, first I just, um, one, on behalf of Central Jersey Alumni Social Action Committee, thank you so much, Dr. Hewlett. Thank you so much, Dr. Aikman. Thank you so much, Saint, Dr. St. Clair. And thank you so much, Dr. Morgan, because the information you gave is powerful and it helps a situation where African-Americans can advocate for themselves in this situation. And it is clear that you guys are really doing some, hard, some great work um, some smart work and really encouraging our community. Um, I wanna thank our moderators. 
uh, Dr. Whitney Williams and Dr. Avonia Richardson Miller. You guys did a phenomenal job of moderating um, such an excellent panelist discussion. So we're very um, grateful for, for all of you for participating because everybody's doing good work in this. So thank you so much. Um, I want us to remember some key things with this. Um, I love Dr. Morgan's. Let's go from exploitation to re representation. It is so very important. Um, there are some key things about access and why it is so hard for African Americans to get access to this vaccine because of facilities. So we need to continue to encourage and educate and get that information out there. We also, the great conversation around we need to continue to train black healthcare professionals so we can rebuild that trust in the black community. This is something that even um, in the industry I am, I'm, we're continue to work on too about market access programs um, in the black community. And so um, those are really key things around addressing this health disparity. I was excited to learn about Moderna's clinical study. I, I found out that information before. I had my second Moderna shot today and it was nice to hear it was 100% effective with African-Americans as opposed to 95% efficacy. Um, so that was great news. Um, I won't be having any more kids, but it is good to know that the vaccine has shown that it, it, it is safe. So I'm glad we're addressing these issues around Black um, hesitancy around this vaccine. So I really hope everybody here, um, this was powerful. You can take something back to your families. You can take something to your friends, your neighbors, your classrooms, um, communities. Whatever information we weren't able to address today, we will try our best to get that information out there. Hopefully um, all of the um, healthcare professionals on here today and doctors will be willing to provide contact information. If anybody had any specific questions, um, I think there's a wealth of knowledge here um, and it should be shared. I'm a believer when you share information, um, it's a good thing. Um, um, so, so I just, um, want to say thank you because we don't want to decrease our lifespan. I was a little nervous about the three years, Dr. Morgan. I'm trying to make it to 100. So I want to increase that lifespan. Um, so um, let's do what we can do um, so we all can have healthy and, and long lives. Again, I just want to remind everybody, if you enjoyed this program, we have another one, um, May 19th. So you can go to cjadelta.org to register. Again, we have a survey in the chat. Um, please give us any feedback. Uh, we will, again, any additional questions. We will try to get that information out to you because we have all your email addresses. So I want to um, bid everybody a good night. God bless. Continue to mask up. Continue to be safe. Continue to be healthy. Eat right and exercise. All those are key factors. So thank you and good night.